So my name is Ray. I'm from San Francisco. I work with Code Pink Women for Peace, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about that and about our strategies and tactics for how to move forward. So where do we go from here? When I hear that question, I start thinking about where did we come from? And I look back at, at um, what's happened over the last 30 years, just a little longer than I've been alive. And today at this conference, I've heard a lot of buzzwords like sustainability, uh, like green jobs, like cutting down on climate change. These terms didn't even exist in the way that we're talking about them 30 years ago when I was still a twinkle in my mom's eye. And I think that that is just one mark of how far we've come. And I think that in the left, as progressives, we have to not lose sight of how far we've come in this movement and celebrate our victories, even when there's so much that we see going wrong in the world. The other question I think of when I think of where do we go from here, because I wanted to be an astronaut when I was a kid, I start thinking, well, outer space, obviously. <laughs> but if we're not going to outer space, seriously, we're pretty much stuck on this planet, this beautiful little blue and green planet that we live on. And there isn't any place to go but that. And so if that's our reality, then we need to start taking care of it and managing our resources and looking at where our planet is going um, in a much more serious way. And there's an activist, Joanna Macy, that I work with in the US a lot, and she talks about the great turning, um, this time of uh, chipping away at structures that are no longer serving us and evolving new structures that work. And in that turning, which direction are we turning? I don't know, what do you think, left or right? Which way do you want to go? <laughs> left, maybe? I think we're in the middle of a real global left turn that's happening right now. So what is this picture? Tahrir Square. Tahrir Square, that's right. And we got to hear some um, from Nadia earlier about this amazing movement, the Egyptian Revolution. Um, and I think it's worth acknowledging just the tremendous impact of the Arab Spring on the whole world um, and how much that's inspired this, what I would call, global left turn. Um, here's photos from other protests throughout the Arab world. And then, of course, as you know, that this movement then uh, finally came to the U.S. in the form of Occupy Wall Street and now has spread through this global revolution of Occupy events that's happening around the country. So how are these movements successful? Well, one thing is the use of social media to grow protests. Um, the YouTube of Asma Mahfouz asking people to come down to Tahrir Square and uh, to, to protest and stand up. The use of Twitter, the use of Facebook to make these movements broadcast farther than they have uh, and quicker than ever before. Um, the use of hacking, and this is uh, the anonymous mask, um, to quickly uh, try to counter the dis imbalance of power. Uh, but I think that technology is not enough, and we need to recognize that it's one tool in our activist toolbox, but what's really affecting change is people getting in the streets. It's not about clicktivism or armchair activism. It's about people really getting out there and making a difference. And how are they making a difference? Well, they're not using AK-47s. They're not using machetes. Uh, yes, they're using social media, but really what's at the crux of this is nonviolent direct action. And it's that nonviolence that I think captivates people um, and also makes the protests feel uh, accessible and engaging and using a, a, a time-honored tradition um, of organizing. Um, and I think that one of the next steps in this movement is balancing the, the creation of tangible, real goals, right? People keep asking, what's the goal of Occupy Wall Street? What are the demands? Withholding the broader vision of systemic change so that it doesn't become just about uh, passing one piece of legislation or electing a certain elected official or getting co-opted by a political party. Uh, but it also doesn't stay so nebulous and vague that it's this big, we just want revolution concept. And that's the challenge that the General Assemblies are daily working out. Um, so moving right along. Um, this is one of my favorite signs from the demonstration in, in New York. If only the war on poverty was a real war, then we would actually be putting money into it. <laughs> and I think that this movement demands us to use our unique gifts and to um, really plug in with specific skills, whether that's first aid or creating a library or being a strategic advisor or doing a training on nonviolent action. It's not just about show up and carry a sign. It's about shine the way that you shine best. So in that perspective, what is Code Pink doing that's shining in our own particular way? And I want to tell you a bit about that. Here's Code Pink. It's a group of women that started in 2003 
before the Iraq invasion happened, and they were women environmental activists that recognized the impact of war on women and the earth, and they got together and formed this preemptive strike. And in a sense, it was an Occupy action. They pitched tents outside the White House in DC and camped out for months trying to keep the US from going to war. And as you know, and probably some of you were part of, the world marched and said no, and still the US invaded. And uh, you know, after all these years, We've created tremendous destruction, both Iraq and Afghanistan, but we have kept on going, organizing creative protests to stand up against the wars, uh, and also to redirect our resources into life-affirming activities like healthcare and education, green jobs and renewable energy. And we do that with really creative tactics. Um, so recently, uh, you probably heard in the news that the Iraq war is over, so can't we have a celebration? <laughs> but as you probably know, uh, there's still a private army of over 5,500 U.S. contractors there uh, that are guarding over 10,000 State Department employees, and they're not leaving Iraq anytime soon. And the Iraq war has resulted in hundreds of thousands of civilian deaths, thousands of soldier deaths. It's a complete disaster. Uh, but most people don't know that, and they're not seeing photos like this one of the soldiers that are coming home in boxes. And so at Code Pink, we try to show that message creatively. And I think that when we say, where do we go next, one of the answers is we have to get creative about how we use our tactics. So here's some examples of that. Um, we made this giant aerial image on the beach in Los Angeles, showing the number of soldiers who had been killed with crosses and spelling out, women say no to war. We also recently created a 99% aerial image at the Occupy K Street in Washington, DC. And we've illustrated the civilian deaths by uh, creating lines and lines of shoes and tagging them with the names of Iraqi civilians and ages of civilians who have been killed. Here's a memorial we built in DC with piles of those shoes, trying to humanize the war, trying to bring it home, make it imaginative, make it real for people. Um, another thing that we do is when we don't like someone, we pink slip them. And sometimes we unfurl a pink slip like this. So here is the pink slip Big Banks. We've been participating in a campaign to move your money. And um, we, we say, you know, it's time to pink slip these banks. It's time to, time to pink slip public officials that aren't uh, doing their job and representing their constituents. Um, and it's a way of getting the visual out in a more creative way. Um, so Code Pink launched a campaign to help folks connect the dots between the economic problems and uh, the wars abroad. And our federal budget in the US dedicates 54% of our discretionary funds to military spending. And the US has spent more than 1.3 trillion US dollars for both wars since 2001. So we have a campaign called Bring Our War Dollars Home. And we went to our mayors and we got many, many mayors to pass city resolutions calling for money to be reallocated back to cities for jobs creation instead of to the bloated Pentagon budget. And mayors took that to the US Conference of Mayors, and it passed overwhelmingly. It was the first time mayors in the US had passed an anti-war resolution since the Vietnam War. And then they took that resolution to Congress and to the White House. Now, whether those agencies are listening or not is a matter of how much they're paid off by war profiteers and special interest lobbyists. But it was a really important moment um, and, and a victory that we had this year. And I think we have to make a, a choice as taxpayers. Will we rebuild America or will we continue to bomb Afghanistan? So this is that message on the streets of Occupy Wall Street. Um, we also use pies to illustrate the budget pie. We say, what kind of pie? Occupy. And uh, this is uh, my coworker Janet carrying the, the budget pie. And we say, we want a bigger slice for the people and less for the war. I was really inspired by Bridget, who is here from Canada, holding up the Stop Harper sign. Amazing. Just uh, naming the elephant in the room. We also hold war profiteers accountable. We have a big campaign against drones and robotic warfare. And we're in the process of uh, authoring a book about drone warfare and how destructive it is and how this technology, similar to cluster bombs, cannot become commonplace in how we uh, use our, our armies all over, the, all over the world. And finally, what we're doing right now to plug into the Occupy movement is we're creating womenoccupy.org. It's an, an online space for women to find tips for how to create safe spaces for women at Occupy events so that women feel comfortable spending the night, um, so that women have information about um, what to do in the case of a sexual assault. 
Uh, and there's a Safer Spaces Committee at Occupy Wall Street that we helped to start and run. And I think that's really important. It's also important that women have equal agency in the Occupy process and the speaking and facilitation of the General Assemblies. Um, I want to say something on a more personal note about what we do and what, uh, when we say where do we go from here, I also ask the question, where are we going in Israel and Palestine? And in this map you can see the green area that used to be Palestinian land and over the years has deteriorated into small, what some people would call bantistans, little areas that isolate and segregate people from the rest of the population. And who knows what that is going to happen in the future, right? As settlements continue to expand, um, as there are less and less human rights for Palestinians. And this is an issue that touches me personally as an American Jew and a descendant of Israeli family. And it took me a long time to come to a place of understanding and seeing what's really going on. What's really going on is the destruction of Gaza, the lack of supplies uh, that are able to reach the, uh, the Gaza Strip, where one and a half million people live in a siege, like an open air prison and also this uh, tremendously huge apartheid wall that separates people. So at Code Pink, we demonstrate the change we want to see by breaking the siege with uh, delegations that have gone into Gaza by land and also supporting the flotillas that try to cross into Gaza by water. And in a moment, you'll have a chance to hear a bit more about that. We also have a campaign following a Palestinian call to boycott and divest from the occupation. This is a product called Ahava. I think it's, uh, it used to be sold at the Bay here in Canada. Um, and uh, it's made in an illegal Israeli settlement and uses pillaged resources from the territories. So I never thought I would be muddy in a bikini protesting the Israeli occupation, but it's true. Um, this is another way of holding people accountable. We, we track Israeli war criminals, and I was in Congress in May when Netanyahu, the Israeli Prime Minister, was speaking, and I uh, had an opportunity to be able to stand up, unfurl a banner, and call out equal rights for Palestinians during his talk. And the man that you see there uh, assaulted me and threw me on the ground and roughed up my neck, and I was taken to the hospital and then arrested, and um, uh, it was pretty intense action. And I got a lot of publicity, including this article in a mainstream major newspaper in Israel. And I think it's really important that, um, especially as a young Jew, to call out what's happening and to say it's not anti-Israel, it's not an un-American to critique an occupying force and call out for human rights and for justice. Um, this is another image that we have. Um, major, mainly what we do, again, going back to bring our word dollars home, is saying we don't want our U.S. money to be enabling and funding the Israeli occupation. And so we say uh, we want to end U.S. military aid to Israel. and get Just like we stopped uh, supporting the big banks with our personal money, we don't want to be supporting this big machine with our uh, tax money. Um, so we're living in this incredibly exciting time right now, and we're witnessing and taking part in the birth of this massive new nonviolent movement. And these movements are harnessing the power of technology to make change and are spreading the word at unprecedented speeds. And I want to say there's this old saying, you know, we are the ones we've been waiting for, and we're not waiting anymore. We're making it happen through this Occupy movement, through all of these creative campaigns that we're engaged in. Um, so, just to say what I just said in a clearer way with a little acronym, art, right? Put art back in everything. Use accountability. Create things, radical, use radical creativity, and participate in the great turning. And if you want another metaphor, one that I learned about yesterday from this conference, uh, we can look at this picture and <laughs> learn from Dorothy um, about the three things that we need as we move forward. One, we need a brain. We need to learn more from history. We need to understand social movements more. We need more strategic, long-term thinking and visioning rather than only responding to what's in the news. Two, we need a heart. We need to connect with people's values. We need to speak to people where they're at with what's important to them and find where the tipping point is going to be um, and intimately. And three, we need courage. We need to be able to name the elephant in the room, to stand up in the face of power and racism and oppression and hold people accountable. And then finally, we can click our heels three times and realize that there is truly no place like home. No place like this beautiful blue and green planet that comes fully equipped with diverse life and enough resources to sustain it. We bring our war dollars home, we bring our foreign policy issues home to make them relevant, and we increase connections to our immediate community, food sources, banking institutions, and so on.